Hello, and this is the video for The Great Gatsby, Chapter 4. Finally, we get some plot. We don't just have world building, although there is a lot of world building here, but we finally get like a teensy little piece of plot towards the end of the chapter. Um, this, you can kind of um, divide the chapter into about four, maybe five sections, depending on how in-depth you want to get. I'm going to take each one kind of chapter or uh, section by section as we go through. So the first part of the chapter is Carraway essentially giving a huge list of people who he wrote down came to Gatsby's parties as he attended them. And I, I, I don't know if any of these people are real people or just imaginary. Um, but the important thing to look at here are is the names themselves, especially when he talks about the people from East Egg, the wealthy section, and West Egg. East Egg, all of the names suggest this higher level of class, um, this idea of old money, you know, almost an English system of you know, lordship and things like that. You know, these are people who have had money, they've had money in their family for generations, and this is their continuation of that wealth. Whereas the people who live in West Egg, the less wealthy section, these are all, all the names suggest kind of a, a modern, you know, wealthiness. They're names that don't have the gravity of the people in East Egg. So, when when we're talking about east and west right we go back to that idea from the first couple chapters of you know the people from the west not being a real part of this east coast life here's another example of that and it goes down to you know that idea of we've had wealth and importance for generations and generations thus we are worth more and you do not understand that world. And here it is laid out in, in name form for us. There's also talks of um, artist types, but also business types, which gives you an idea of the roundedness of Gatsby's influence, how he attracts people from the artistic section, um, but also the wealth section, which is also or the financial section, which is laid out later in the chapter, right? When we get to the Wolfsheim section, that that is the financial interest, right? Here you have, uh, we'll talk about it more later, but you have a man who is uncultured, but very wealthy and powerful, right? So Gatsby runs with and is admired by people in that section. And then later in the Daisy section, right, it talks about um, just what an influence he artistically quote unquote had on Daisy. So he, the level of people who are attracted to him are old money, it's new money, it's artistic people and it's people more involved in like finances and less on the artistic side. right? So the the scope, the world of Gatsby, you know, is not confined to anything, which is important going into the second section of this chapter, which is Gatsby's backstory, at least from Gatsby's point of view, right? Uh, Carraway right away describes it as disconcerting, which means um, it causes problems for him. It causes him to doubt things. And it's interesting that Gatsby says, I'll tell you God's truth, because the entire... All of this chapter is in establishing Gatsby as a godlike figure. Before they leave for, you know, their drive, there's a description of the car with the white and the gold and, or the bronze or whatever it is, right? And the labyrinths in there. And it's, it's almost like a chariot. It's much like the chariot of Apollo right, as he guides the sun across the sky, right? It's white, it's golden, 
It even talks about how there are designs of suns in it. The labyrinth brings up this Greek god um, uh, imagery. He's wearing a caramel colored suit, right? Bronze, like a god. You would think a god if you saw him at this moment. And so it's interesting that he says, I'll tell you God's truth. It's like he is playing into that myth of him as a god, right? And like a god, um, not, not Christian god or any other religious god, but when we think about mythological gods, right? Their origins are mysterious and they're convoluted, right? Being born out of these things or appearing out of the sea or things like that. And... <laughs> Excuse me, Gatsby has the same type of mythos to him, right? The chapter even starts with people saying he's a bootlegger and he killed a guy, right? And things like that. In previous chapters, we've just had hints. And then the spectacle around him, like we talked about in the previous chapter, all kind of reflect this mysterious origin story that we have of Greek gods. Greek gods, we, you know, if you know the stories, you know them, but it's still like, really? That's, they were swallowed by your father and that's what is happening here, right? Carraway doesn't believe Gatsby's Oxford story and even the proof that Gatsby provides the photo of him with people from Oxford, 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 um, is not clear evidence, right? Just talks about, it's a picture of him not much younger than he is at that moment with these other gentlemen in front of a place that looks vaguely collegiate, right? There's no marking that says, you know, uh, Oxford College. There's definitely no datum that says when he went there. So again, contributing to this background of mystery that Gatsby has. However, when he starts talking about the his experience in the war, that then becomes real for Carraway. And remember, Carraway left the Midwest to go to the East because he was in World War I and felt that his world was too small. And so this description of war and the metal that Gatsby shows him is all the proof that Carraway needs to believe, wait a minute, this guy is probably telling me at least some of the truth. And thus, he starts to believe in God. Uh, another thing that... Um, that denies Gatsby's credibility is he says he's from, you know, going back to the mysterious origin, he's from a wealthy family. They're all dead, by the way. Everybody's dead. You can't check on any of this. But he comes from this wealthy family in the Middle West. And Carraway asks, oh, where in the Midwest? And he says, San Francisco. Now, in no, in no world was San Francisco ever considered a Midwest town. Chicago is Midwest, right? St. Louis would be Middle West, right? So in no way would San Francisco ever be considered a Midwest city, right? It's West Coast or Far West, right? So, you know, the, the mysterious origin, but the, the very vivid and real descriptions of his experiences in World War I in Montenegro are enough for Carraway to start believing. And then there's that odd section right at the end of Gatsby's little story there where they go over the bridge and there are all these descriptions of things that are unbelievable. Let's characterize them as miracles, right? So here you have this godlike figure with mysterious origins, but is proficient in war, and now all of a sudden being with him creates all these miracles, all of this wonder. It all adds into this, uh, this creation of Gatsby as a god. Okay. After that, we then get Wolfsheim. Wolfsheim, uncultured, right? Even though he's at a nice restaurant, right? He orders hash. He eats it disgustingly. He does not have, I mean, Carraway 
goes out of his way to mimic uh, the, the way that Wolfsheim speaks. So he's uncultured. However, later, Gatsby's like, you know that guy? Yeah, he, uh, he's the one who fixed the 1919 World Series. So, so it's here you have a man who is uncultured, who by all rights does not fit that East Coast uh, style of old money and class right? He is not well-educated. He is not cultured, but yet he has this definite influence and he's very financially well off, right? He knows people. He act, offers to get Caraway some help for something and Gatsby's like, no, 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 wrong guy, wrong guy. So what does this all mean? Wolfsheim represents this world that Gatsby actually inhabits and Gatsby wants to be included in this old section. He reflects that, the, the old money, but he is really part of this, this new money, uncultured, seedy underworld of the East Coast, right? And Wolf Sheen, and it's also interesting that Gatsby admires him, right? Oh, he's good, he's great, he's good, right? This is what he strives to be. Right, this person who has all this wealth and influence, but doesn't have to play the game of, ha you know, having upbringing and culture and education. Right, which brings us back to the Oxford thing. Why is that so shaky in the details? Probably because it's not true. There's prob he probably never went to Oxford. And so by admiring Wolf, or let me go back. So by him stating that, that is him trying to at least have some sort of leg in the East Coast style of money. Okay, this is very confusing. But, you know, he's trying to project this image of a world where you know, where he belongs in this world, but yet he admires the man who doesn't fit that world, but still has everything that world has to offer, right? So he is trying to bridge, to go back to the metaphor before, to bridge that gap between East and West. Okay, let's move on. Uh, then we get the daisy section, right? And this can either be considered one section on its own, or we can break it up into Daisy's backstory and then Nick and Jordan. But I'm just going to stick with Daisy. Tragic story, right? It's Romeo and Juliet, right? You have rich girl, poor boy, fall desperately madly in love. He goes off to war. She has to stay. And... Again, that East-West idea that's Romeo and Juliet. She comes from a world of old money where you marry somebody who is of similar or better breeding than you, which is a derogatory term, but better breeding than you, has as much, if not more, wealth and influence, right? So she, even if Gatsby never leaves, she can't marry him. That's not going to happen. And it's devastating. And then he leaves and she can't even see him anymore. So it leads to this scene where she is drunk on her wedding day, doesn't want to get married, has to be thrown in a cold shower by Jordan Baker, and then comes to her senses, quote unquote, and marries Tom Buchanan. Right, so it's very tragic, and it adds to, you know, when you go back to chapter one, Daisy is really upset that Tom is seeing not so much that he has this girl on the side, that he has Myrtle on the side, but the fact that it is seeping into their idealistic home life. She has company over. She has Nick and Jordan there. And the girl calls, right? That's not okay. The fact that he has a mistress, that's one thing. But when 
she has to atone for that when she has to make up stories for him, make excuses for him, when he is destroying the facade, that white outside compared to the red inside of the building, that is what upsets her, right? So, you know, she gave up the love of her life for him, for this world that she has to, as the daughter of this old wealthy family, that she has to inhabit, right? And Tom is destroying that. Or not destroying it, but he is flaunting his influence and his power. And she doesn't like that. She gave up something for that world. Tom should at least be discreet. And he's not being discreet about it. All right. End of the chapter. We get Nick and Jordan by themselves. Nick at one point has a phrase in his head repeating, there are only the pursued, the pursuing, the busy, and the tired. And it's interesting that if you take our five main characters in the book, you can fit them in any of these categories. So I'm not saying that his description of people are wrong, right? You are either somebody who is chasing something or you are someone who is being chased. You are either somebody working tirelessly in order to achieve something, or you are somebody who is exhausted by life, right? That's very true. However, when we think back to Carraway's description of himself in the first chapter, he talks about he's somebody who reserves judgment. And all of these categories he lays out do not carry any sort of judgment, right? There's a little bit of a connotation between pursue, uh, pursuer and pursued, pursuee, pursued, pursued, the pursued and the pursuer, right? There's a little bit of a connotation there, right, between aggressiveness and passivity, but it's not, it's not enough to really, you know, to really characterize and categorize somebody. So it's interesting that he chooses these categories for people in that he is not somebody who judges people. He puts them in a very, okay, this is somebody who is busy, right? Who is going out and trying to get things. This is somebody who is being sought after and people want to be with or get with, right? So it's interesting in terms of his, his personality and his view of himself. It would also be interesting if he would uh, have stated where the five main people, I guess you could keep himself outside. So the other four main people in his life right now, where he would categorize them. Because we can, based on his descriptions, we could probably make those cate cate categorizations for him. But it would be interesting to see if he, if what our inference is, matches how he has been describing them and what we say it is, right? I think there would be some inconsistencies. Anyway, so that's the end of chapter four. Thank you very much. I'll see you all soon.